Genesis and part one on Microfilm 101. We may hate it, but Microfilm has preserved their collective history for nearly a century. Microphotography was toyed with as early as 1830, but it wasn't until the 20th century that its value would be fully appreciated. A New York City banker hired Eastman Kodak to Microfilm canceled checks. The venture steamrolled, and by 1935, Kodak's Reprographics Division Record Act was preserving and selling the New York Times on 35mm microfilm. This made the value of microfilm as a preservation medium obvious, especially within the library community, and an explosion of newspaper microfilming quickly followed. The oldest newspapers, if they survived at all, held up well over time because they were made of cotton and linen rag fiber. By the American Revolution, newsprint demands caused a rag shortage, which raised costs. The race was on to find a cheap substitute. Wood pulp won that race, though it would be 1860 before it became commercially available. With wood pulp newsprint, American newspaper titles increased more than 30% during the 1870s alone. Yet wood pulp is highly acidic, and the paper becomes brittle, discolored, and dirty with smeared ink. By 1920, newspapers from the 1870s were already suffering severe deterioration. And since nearly all American newspapers were using wood pulp paper by 1882, nearly all were going to turn to dust within a lifetime, even under the best conditions. But publishers didn't care about that. Their goal was to distribute news as cheaply as possible, and wood pulp was the way to do it. Meanwhile, preservation was running out of time. Newspaper microfilm pioneers took to the streets with portable copy stands and cameras. In most cases, they went directly to the publishers, whose storage was rarely ideal, both in space and environment. Even when the well-intentioned publishers bound their issues, which suggests some kind of order, there was no guarantee that order was correct or consistent. And if they were bound out of order, of course, you couldn't rearrange the issues or pages to put them right on the microfilm. Then there was the whole lighting problem. Most of the portable filming units had only two lights of varying strength, making uniform lighting impossible. If the light was too concentrated in one place, the text was blown out. Too little light, and the page edges were black. And quality control was virtually non-existent. Many times, poor lighting wasn't recognized until after the film was developed, and that usually happened in a lab, apart from the source document's home, and by then, refilming was impossible. In those early days, there were no universal best practices. Instead, the rules relied on shop-to-shop or filmer-to-filmer decisions, so they were all over the place. Still, some shops and filmers were consistent, even if the work was less than stellar, and there's something to be said for that. It would be nearly 50 years before solid microfilm standards were developed. Organizations like ANSI and AIM had put together an industry-focused set of microfilm standards by the early 1980s. For instance, standard MS-23 explains how to make and maintain over time first-generation silver gelatin microfilm of newspapers. More library-focused standards from RLG and the Library of Congress followed suit in the 1990s. RLG's Preservation Microfilming Handbook provides guidance on content creation and remains as valued now as the day it was created. And today, the RLG guidelines include microfilming with an eye towards digitization. The United States newspaper program funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities began in 1982. It was a cooperative effort between each state and the NEH to locate, catalog, and preserve on microfilm U.S. newspapers from the 18th century to present. The collective nature of USMP helped further refine and solidify preservation microfilming standards and herald their broad adoption, not to mention the massive undertaking of Mark Record's creation that has become an extraordinary anthology of American newspaper heritage. The USMP standards were still a work in progress in the early years. As you venture into digitization from microfilm, don't be completely surprised if your USMP microfilm isn't as pristine as you expect. Make no mistake, it's still good film. And by the same token, don't discount pre-USMP film either. It could be completely crappy or it could be good, but either way, it's almost certainly good enough to digitize. Some microfilm, no matter how imperfect, is still better than no microfilm at all. So now let's look at key components for a modern newspaper microfilm program. These include selection, preparation, image capture, quality control, assembly and delivery, and storage and long-term maintenance. At the University of Kentucky, we had such a program for over 50 years, so we'll use it as an example. Our mission was to preserve as many of Kentucky's newspapers as we could. When we ceased operations in 2009, we were preserving over 150 Kentucky titles. We tried to represent each of Kentucky's 120 counties with at least one title from each county. Your state's demographics and directives may be slightly different, but some combination like this is generally what drives selection.
Once newspaper selections are made, each issue and page is inspected, paying particular attention to incorrect page dates plus anything out of order, missing, or illegible. Incorrect dates and out-of-order pages are obviously easy to fix. For missing and illegible content, publishers are usually happy to send a better copy for replacement. The number of pages per issue multiplied by the number of issues that will fit on a single reel of microfilm determines what you put on a reel. This is called reel programming. It could be as little as two weeks of a large daily or maybe two years for a small monthly. Meanwhile, you're accumulating issues, and they have to be stored somewhere, so a cool, dark room is best to keep discoloration to a minimum. When thousands of newspapers in all sorts of horrible conditions were being filmed by USMP, real programming was naturally a bit more relaxed. Factors that may have grouped newspapers together were things like anticipated similar densities, completeness, size of the physical newspaper, or order of publication. What didn't and should never drive real programming is grouping newspapers randomly or by subject, like filming all temperance newspapers on a single reel, for example. With enough issues for a reel, the next step is to separate the double sheets into single sheets. This allows easy page turning and further minimizes out-of-order pages. After the pages are split into single sheets, they're ironed to remove creases and the page-wide fold lump. These flat sheets help create accurate OCR during digitization. Next comes image capture. Targets play a key role in how well a user will understand the content on the reel. They're also critical for the technical integrity of the microfilm as a photographic product. For example, a density target follows start. For the best density readings, placing a white ceramic tile in each corner and a fifth tile in the center is ideal to check for uniform lighting and density. Ceramic tiles are preferred because they can be cleaned and they don't fade. The density targets are filmed at the beginning and end of the reel. A significant change between the two sets can signal problems with the camera, lighting, film, or film development. The density target is followed by a series of identifier targets unique to the institution or company. These are followed by a copyright statement, the newspaper's title, and anything extraordinary about the title that a user might find illuminating, a bibliographic mark record of the title, a thorough guide to contents target that's been compiled during the previous inspection step. This is followed by a best copy statement, and finally, a resolution target. Like the density target, a resolution target is filmed at the beginning and end of each reel. A set of line pairs is placed in all four corners of the frame and a fifth in the center. And just like the density tiles, these are measured to ensure consistent quality resolution throughout the reel. If they're not the same from beginning to end, there's probably something wrong with the imaging system and refilming may be necessary. After all the opening targets have been filmed, two blank exposures are created, and then the filming of the newspaper begins. The newspaper is filmed with appropriate in-text targets, like side dates, at the beginning of each issue, and it may include missing page or issue targets. It's highly unusual for older film to include these targets, which makes collation of the microfilm tedious, yet even more important. Otherwise, you really won't know what you have. Additionally, two blank exposures are inserted between each issue. If mistakes happen, the whole issue can be refilmed and easily inserted. Current standards call for two inches of blank film between images for a splice insert, which makes splicing a breeze. Older microfilm didn't do this, so it's not unusual to find images that have been cut in half, and everything just gets really, really confusing. Modern splicing rules make everything better. Finally, the reel concludes with resolution, density, continued on next reel where appropriate, which is most every reel for contemporary newspapers, and end of reel targets. The film is processed and undergoes rigorous quality control. It's inspected for quality resolution, density, and physical veracity before it's checked frame by frame for proper targeting and organization. If there are any anomalies, such as bad focus, over or under exposures, out of order issues or pages, incorrect targets, or any other factor that would diminish the integrity of the physical or intellectual reel, the film is corrected with refilms, allowing no more than six splices per reel. Once the camera master microfilm passes all inspections, the newspapers are discarded. Yes, discarded. There's not enough room in the universe to keep every newspaper, no matter how much you want to. Besides, modern newspapers are wood pulp, and they'll turn to dust before your grandchildren reach high school. That's why microfilming is so vitally important for newspapers. Anyway, the papers are tossed and a printmaster negative is created, as well as any positive copies that have been ordered. The master and printmaster are housed in archival boxes with archival labels and then stored in a temperature and humidity controlled environment. 
In part two on Microfilm 101, we'll look at the physical attributes of microfilm. And in the meantime, don't panic.